In this video, we're going to talk about some specifics of the equity markets. We're not going to talk about everything in the equity markets here. But we're just going to talk about some specifics which are important for the derivatives market. And there are a couple of key points I want to talk about. One is just the mechanics of dividends. And the second is the mechanics of short selling. So both of these we'll need to know and at least think about when thinking about derivative securities on stocks or on, say, indices like the S&P 500. So the first topic is dividends. So the owner of a share is entitled to div any dividends that the company pays. All right, and there are several key dates. So the thing that I really want to talk about with respect to dividends are these dates. So there's a declaration or an announcement date, a record date, an ex-dividend date, and a payment date. So let's go look for a second at some dividends that were announced. Okay, so this is the Market Beat website. Um, you can find this information all sorts of places on the internet, but these are dividends that were announced on September 17th, 2020. So the announcement date here is September 17th, 2020. If I look at this first row, that's Abbott Laboratories, uh, stock ticker ABT. And there was an announcement for a dividend of 36 cents. Now this company, Abbott Laboratories, pays quarterly dividends. So every quarter, they're going to make an announcement like this. There's the ex-dividend date, October 14th, the record date, October 15th, and the payable date, November 16th, 2020. So I want to talk about each of these dates in turn and also think a little bit about what happens to the stock on those days. So the first date is the announcement date. The announcement date is when the company announces. We just saw Abbott Labs announce on September 17th, 2020, what the next dividend would be. Now the date is often associated with movements in the share price. So the market has an expectation. The market thinks Abbott Laboratories is going to make a particular announcement, 36 or 38 or 40 or 22 or whatever it is. And the announcement that Abbott Laboratories makes might be different if for example, the announcement is much bigger than what was expected. One typically associates that with the companies doing well and the share price goes up. If, on the other hand, the announcement is less, the market typically doesn't like it when companies cut their dividends. And so if the, mar if the market expectation is 30 cents and Abbott Laboratories says 26, that's usually seen as bad and the share price falls. So the announcement date tends to be a day in which share price moves sometimes significantly. The next key date is called the record date. So the record date is the date on which a shareholder must own the shares in order to receive the dividend. So if one purchase, purchases shares prior to the record date, then in order to receive the dividend, the transaction must settle on or before the record date. So again, in the United States, share settlement is not immediate. So if there's a delay, let's say, of two days to settle the shares, I need to own those shares on the record date or else I'm not in the shareholder registry and the company is not going to pay me the dividend. The company will pay the dividend to the previous owner. So the record date is an important date in terms of whether I receive or don't receive the dividend. But one does not really expect market movements to be associated with the record date. Right? We already know we're either receiving the dividend or not receiving the dividend if we own the shares, if the share transactions that happened before the record date have already settled. The ex-dividend date is the key date. So the ex-dividend date is the first date for which stock settlement is after the record date. If you purchase the stock prior to the ex-dividend date, then you'll receive the dividend. And if you purchase it at, on or after the ex-dividend date, then you will not. So again, if we go back to that table and think about it for a second, the ex-dividend date was one business day prior to the record date. And why is that? Well, if I buy it the day before the ex-dividend date, two business days before the record date, then my transaction will settle and I will be on the shareholder registry on the record date, in which case I get the dividend. One business day prior to the record date, if I buy my shares on that date, then I won't receive the dividend. So the ex-dividend date is associated with share price movements. 
namely the day before the ex-dividend date, the dividend, that amount that I'm going to receive, is in the share price. If I buy the shares the day before the ex-dividend date, I will receive that money. The day after, I will not receive that money. Typically, what one expects is, again, all else being equal, which it probably never is, but all else being equal, the share price will fall by the value of the dividend. Okay, so if one owns a share worth $100 on the day prior to the ex-dividend date and the company is paying a dollar dividend and there are no other price movements, then one would expect to have a $99 share and a $1 dividend on the payment date. So the share price should fall by the present value of the dividend. Now, the dividends are typically paid relatively quickly, and so the present value of the dollar is probably pretty close to the dollar, in which case one typically thinks of the share price falling by the amount of the dividend on the ex-dividend date. And it happens immediately, right? Once the share opens and starts trading on the ex-dividend date, it is trading without the dividend, x the dividend, and is trading at a lower value. Now, this lower value is not arbitrageable. You can't, and we'll see it later, you can't short the stock on the day before the ex-dividend date and go long again on the, on the ex-dividend date and make that dividend amount. So we'll see the mechanics of short selling preclude that. Okay, the last date that's important is the payment date, and this is the date when the dividend is paid. And this date is not associated with movements in the share price due to the dividend. Why not? Because everything that happened, we already know, right? We already know who's going, how big the dividend's going to be. We already know who's going to receive it. And if I'm buying and selling the shares, I'm certainly not going to receive it because the payment date is after the record date, which is after the ex-dividend date. And so if I'm buying or selling the shares on the payment date, then I'm not, if I'm buying them, sorry, if I'm buying the shares on the payment date, then I am not going to receive the dividend. Okay, so that's dividends. Now let's talk about shorting equities. And again, this is a mechanics kind of question. And the reason we have to go into the mechanics is that it matters when trading derivatives and when thinking about the value that's within derivatives is how do we actually do this? So short sales, what is a short sale? So in certain circumstances, you may want to short stock, and that involves selling stock that you do not own. So you're going to profit from a falling share price. Why do you do this? Lots of people do this. Designated market makers do this. Why do designated market makers do this? It's because, again, when we think about a market maker, if you've ever thought about a market maker, the easiest way to think about a market maker is a market maker has a portfolio of shares. You call them up, you want to buy them, they sell them to you. They can make a price and they tell, sell you the shares. That's not really how it works. The market maker makes markets, makes prices, bid and ask, and they will either buy shares from you at a slightly lower price or sell them to you at a slightly higher price. But usually they're not, they don't own the shares, right? And you come to the market maker and you say you want to buy shares, then the market maker will sell them to you and then buy them back in the market. The period between when they sell them to you and when they buy them back in the market, they're short. They actually have a couple of days to actually do this transaction. Now they're trading all the time, so it doesn't matter. There's no real problem here because the trade that you traded doesn't settle. Right? And the fact that the market maker buys some shares from one place and sells them to someone else really doesn't matter. It matters in terms of settlement, making sure we understand where all the shares are supposed to go. But the reality is they can sell something they don't own as long as they buy them before they have to deliver them. Trade settlement, same sort of thing. You buy some shares. You have two days to settle. Turns out the person who sold you the shares made a mistake, clicked the wrong button, sold you some shares they didn't own. At this point, your trade settlement's going to fail, right? Because there are no shares. But it doesn't. And why doesn't it? Because your broker goes out, borrows the, mark, the shares from somebody else, and delivers them to you. The broker's now short. The broker will manage that situation. Equity pairs trading. Equity pairs trading is a strategy where one profits from the outperformance of one stock 
versus another stock, typically closely related stocks. Think Coke and Pepsi, right? Those are two very similar companies. One might be doing better than the other right now. And generally, the trader is not trying to make money from generally the market moving. The strategy doesn't care about general market moves. The strategy cares about outperformance of one of those stocks versus the other. How do you achieve that? You go long Coke and short Pepsi or vice versa. You go in the right proportions so that when the market moves, you know, both of them move roughly in line with the market in the same way. So when the S&P 500 moves, they both move in the same direction. You make money on one, you lose on the other, net nothing. And all that's really happening is because you're long one and short the other. When the one you're long outperforms the one you're short, you will make money, regardless of whether those shares go up or down. Now, my experience of short selling was through derivatives hedging. I would sell options, and in order to hedge those options, I needed to go short some shares. Okay, securities lending is the other side of this business. So you can't short sell if no one will lend you the security. This business is called securities lending, right? I own some shares, I'm willing to lend them to you. It's generally a low risk business. Lender accepts cash or low risk securities like treasury bills as collateral, and they pay sub market interest rates on that collateral, right? The lender of the shares is borrowing money. They're borrowing money at a lower rate than they would otherwise do because they're giving you collateral against that borrowing. So they get the cash. Now, the easiest way for this to work would be they get the cash, they invest the cash and earn market rates, and they earn this spread. The alternative to that would be, let's say I own a large portfolio of stocks and I temporarily need some cash to, you know, pay something, right? To make a payment. And, but I know in the next three or four weeks, I'm going to get that cash back from somewhere else. So I need to borrow money. My incentives are to borrow that money as cheaply as possible. If I've got a lot of shares in a portfolio and I'm not doing anything otherwise with them, I could use those shares as collateral to borrow that money I need short term. I pay a lower rate. And then when I'm done borrowing that money, I can pay it back and I get my shares back. Stock lending. So the lender of a stock does not retain ownership, but retains some ownership rights. They are entitled to the dividend payments and they're entitled to the right to sell the stock whenever they choose. They don't retain voting rights. So if I'm the lender of a stock, I still retain the right to sell when I choose and I retain the right to those dividend payments. I don't retain voting rights. Why? Because I don't own the shares any longer. I've lent them to somebody else and they've done something else with it. And so I'm not on the shareholder registry and thus I can't vote. Okay, so I found this website a long time ago. I don't think Interactive Brokers is still around. Um, settlement's gone from T plus three to T plus two. I'm not gonna walk through all of this, but I just wanna walk through the mechanics of a short sell. So up there in purple is Trader A who wants to sell something short, sell some shares short. So first they go to the broker, they go to the broker and say, hey, oops, sorry, hey, I wanna sell some shares short. The broker says yes or no, they have some inventory. The broker does what's called locates the shares. If the answer is yes, the trader's allowed to execute short sale. If the broker can't find the shares, the trader's not allowed to execute the sale. The short sale is thus just a standard transaction in the market. Sells the shares short and then waits two days now to settle the transaction. To settle the transaction, we need shares and we're gonna receive cash. The shares come from the broker. He borrows them from somebody. The broker gives the trader the shares, the shares, are then sold to Trader B, so they go into Trader B's account and cash is given back to Trader A. That cash is posted as collateral with the broker. <clears throat> that cash is going to earn interest just at a lower rate than they would otherwise earn interest, right? So the trader is going to earn interest on that cash. In the end, assuming the trader decides to unwind the transaction, Trader A eventually is going to, trader goes into the market, buys the shares back. Let's assume they're at a lower price. So they've bought at a lower price. They sold at a higher price. They made money. They give those shares back to the broker. The broker gives them back 
their cash. Now, the cash collateral is actually managed throughout the life. So if the share price goes up, the person who lent the shares needs more collateral because the shares are worth more if they're going to get them back. So Trader A, if the share price goes up, Trader A has to post more collateral. That more collateral is basically losses. Share price goes down, Trader A is allowed to retrieve some of that collateral because they've made money and they, the person who's lent the shares doesn't need as much collateral because the shares aren't worth as much. And so Trader A makes the money. In the end, when Trader A goes out back and buys the shares, the collateral amount and the shares basically are at the same value. And so the money that Trader A uses to buy the shares is actually the collateral. Okay, so the borrower of stock must post collateral, typically in cash, sometimes in securities. If the stock price falls, they're allowed to remove collateral. If the stock price increases, they must post additional collateral. If they fail to post collateral, very importantly, if you fail to post collateral, and this is true about most transactions, then your short position may be closed out immediately. Short position being closed out immediately means the broker goes and buys the shares for you in the market. Okay, the borrow cost. One can view the posting of cash collateral as lending cash. You receive interest on this cash at a lower rate than you would on uncollateralized borrowing, and the difference is called the borrow cost. If the interest rate on unsecured borrowing is 3% and you receive 2.5%, then the borrow cost is half a percent. Interest rates on short term borrowing are usually actual over 360. We're going to generally work because we can't see this into this market, we're generally going to work with continuously compounded rates. The actual borrow cost itself is market dependent. Different shares have different borrow costs. Some shares are hard to borrow, and the borrow cost might be high. Some shares are easy to borrow, and the borrow costs are low. At some times, the borrow cost is really, really high, and it's above the interest rate for uncollateralized borrowing. You are, in those circumstances, going to lend somebody cash and pay them interest on the cash you've lent them. Okay, an example. Imagine a stock currently trading at 100. You believe the share price will fall, so you borrow the shares from someone, the broker, sell the shares, assume that interest rates are 3% continuously compounded, and the borrow cost is half a percent continuously compounded. Let's just assume you hold your short position open for 14 days and close it out when the share price is 90. You've made money. All right, so on day 14, you buy the shares in the market, return them to the lender, how much money do you make? When you enter the transaction, you borrowed the shares, sold them for 100, gave 100 to the lender of the shares. When you exit the transaction, you bought the shares for 90, returned the shares to the lender, and received your cash plus interest from the lender. The $10 you make from the sale and purchase of the stock, ignoring the price movements in the stock and thus the fluctuations in the post to collateral, you're gonna make nine and a half cents, 9.6 cents from the cash, right? That's the interest. So your total profit is $10 and 10 cents. If, so some key things here, and this is one of the key things on short sales. If the stock goes X dividend during a, stock, a short transaction, you short sold something, the original owner of the shares should be paid the dividend. The borrower of the stock has to pay the lender of the stock the dividend and the borrower of the stock has already posted cash collateral for the value of the stock. So if the stock were trading at 100, the dividends for a dollar on the day prior to the X dividend date, there's $100 in collateral. On the day after, only $99 in collateral is required. Why? Because the share is only worth 99. The extra dollar is given to the lender of the stock. So normally in a short sale, when the stock doesn't go X dividend, Share price goes from 100 to 99, the dollar can be taken out by the short seller. Here, you have to give it to the lender of the stock in lieu of the dividend. 